Uh, welcome to the 32nd anniversary uh, of the Miami Book Fair. My name is Alicia Giovinazzo. I'm the academic dean of the Kendall campus of Miami Dade College and your room host and introducer for today. Uh, we're delighted to have you here with us. Please consider becoming a member of the Friends of the Book Fair if you are not one already. Your contributions will support this wonderful book fair. Friends receive multiple benefits such as preferential seating and admission to special book fair events. We greatly appreciate our friends that are here with us today. You can also support the fair this year by texting BOOK, capital B-O-O-K, to 501-501 to do donate $10 at this time. You will receive a text back asking to confirm your donation and just reply yes. We're also grateful to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation, OHL Arellano, and the Bac Bacalore Foundation, and so many more that are listed on signage throughout the fair. Miami Book Fair does not end tomorrow. Miami Book Fair programs, events, and activities take place throughout the year here and all over Miami. We are grateful to the college and the hundreds of volunteers that make it all possible. There will be a brief question and answer after the reading discussion of the authors uh, during this session at the, at the last 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and they will also be autographing books immediately after their sessions, which is located on the first floor of this building when you go down the escalators immediately to your left. Now kindly silence your cell phones so there will be no interruptions. And here to, in to introduce um, our special guest, guest authors is Lillian Fine, who is the sponsor of this event. Uh, I will be coming back to introduce, to read, uh, for, to read the bios of the authors once she is done. Thank you. On behalf of myself and my family here today, my sister Jill Manelli, my nephew John O. Manelli, and my partner Edward Robinson, I would like to welcome you to the annual literary event sponsored by the Lillian Fine Memorial Literature Endowment. The intent of the endowment is to offer a presentation on a work or works of literary quality. Its goal is to enhance the love of literature for the widest audience possible in our generation and for generations to come. We are especially grateful to the devoted friends and students of Lillian Fine who so generously contributed to the endowment. Some of you are here today to pay tribute to Lillian Fine. Here's a little bit of background about Lillian Fine. She was born in Milford, Massachusetts, a small town about an hour from Boston. In the 1930s, she came to New York City to get her Master's of Education in, at Columbia Teachers College. Along with my father, Benjamin Fine, former education editor of the New York Times, and their four daughters, they moved to Rockville Center, Long Island in the early 1950s. In 1971, my parents moved to Key Biscayne. Lillian Fine treasured books. She came to the Miami Book Fair every year and often volunteered to work here. She shared her passion for literature with her students, the adults she taught at Miami Dade College and at the Institute for Retired Professionals before giving private classes on her own. Together, they explored a wide spectrum of acclaimed authors, such as Henry James, Kafka, Proust, Nabokov, Thomas Mann, Arthur Miller, James Joyce, and others. She also introduced her students to works by writers of different nationalities and ethnic groups. 
My mother opened the doors for many, and that is why every year we continue to celebrate her spirit and keep her memory alive. A group of her students has even formed the Lillian Fine study group that still gathers to discuss literature, thus perpetuating her legacy. My mother was a worldwide traveler and she would have loved a novel that takes place in such a faraway territory as the jungle of New Guinea. She would have been very happy with today's selection of Lily King's book, Euphoria. Author of a collection of short stories and three novels, King has written works that have won several awards and have been cited as notable books of the year. Euphoria won the Kirkus Award for Fiction, the New England Book Award for Fiction, and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. It will also be made into a feature film. Lillian Fine respected good writing, and Lily King's narrative is beautifully crafted with compelling characters based on real figures who take on a fictional life of their own. The three protagonists, Nell, Wren, and Bankson, are inspired by the anthropologist Margaret Mead, her second husband, Rio Fortune, and her future third husband, Gregory Bateson. While studying the culture of tribal community, communities along the Sepik River in New Guinea, a love triangle develops as the characters become, become connected emotionally, intellectually, and physically to each other. What is thrilling is the manner in which Lily King renders the passionate devotion to their discoveries, especially in Nell's case. Nell describes the, quote, euphoria that comes when everything seems reachable, comprehensible, before the full scope of the work sets in. When the three characters are reading aloud from a book by another anthropologist, this is how the narrator, Bankson, portrays, portrays a kind of euphoria. Quote, Helen's book made us feel we could rip the stars from the sky and write the world anew. Another example of Lily King's exciting prose is how Bankson reveals his intense intellectual and erotic bond with Nell. Her eyes burned into mine when I had an idea she liked. I felt in some ways we've had some sort of sex sex of the mind, sex of ideas, sex of words, hundreds and thousands of words. In her writing, Lily King allows us to penetrate into the minds and hearts of the extraordinary anthropologist whom she has created and recreated in her own original way. We are indeed privileged to have her with us today. Let us welcome this exceptional author, Lily King. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. So let me tell you a little more about the authors that we have here with us today before 
they start their conversation. Lily King and Elizabeth Smith. Uh, Lily King is the award-winning author of four novels, including The Pleasing Hour, The English Teacher, and Father of the Rain. King received her BA in English Literature from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and her MA in Creative Writing, writing from Sarah Cruz University. She has taught English and creative writing at several universities and high schools in the United States and abroad. Euphoria, Grove Press, is Lily King's national best-selling breakout novel, novel of three young gifted anthropologists of the 30th caught in a passionate love triangle that threatens their bonds, their careers, and ultimately their lives. And, and we heard about that novel. Inspired by events in the life of revolutionary anthropologist Margaret Mead, Emily Aiken of the New York Times called Euphoria a taut, witty, fiercely intelligent tale of competing egos and desires in landscape of exotic menace. Elizabeth Smith is, is vice president, editorial director of Grove Atlantic. Since joining the company in 1995, she has edited books by Lily King. Sherman Alexi, Charles Frazier, Leif Anger, Janet Winterson, Tom Drewer, Bob Shakoshif, David Van, and Rabid Alemadine, among others. Please join me in welcoming our two authors. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think the best thing about being at the Miami Book Fair for me is that I'm being called an author <laughs> everywhere I go, <laughs> and I love it. Thank you. Um, I am actually an editor. Um, I am, my name is Elizabeth Schmitz, as you know, and I'm the editorial director of Grove Atlantic. And I've worked there for 20 years. Um, and I'm so lucky that for 17 of those years, I've worked with, with Lily King. Um, I'm, we, I'm the lucky one. <laughs> um, what do I love about Lily's writing? her language, how she writes about fiercely intense emotion, often desire of one kind or another with passionate yet cool precision. Her writing is sublimely intimate, even as she explores the grandest themes, a child's longing for family, a mother's grappling with a traumatic past, a fight for the love of an alcoholic father, and of course, about romantic and intellectual love. Lily's language surprises, excites, and challenges us. She ignites our own passions and imaginations. Her words are sensual and stimulating, poetic, like the chime from a crystal, someone said recently. I love how her writing shows me how to see the extraordinary in every moment. I could go on, <laughs> but um, we're here to talk about, I think, our editing um, and writing process of Euphoria. Um, this is a book, Newsday, called As Concentrated as Orchid Food, packing as much narrative power and intellectual energy into its 250 pages as novels triple its size. And the San Francisco Chronicle said, intense, seductive, sexual, and intellectual. Um, I, I, uh, we have so much to talk about, but what, I, what I'd really love to start with is, is how we first began working together, and I thought maybe Lily could start on that story, because it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I need to say that I could not be luckier to work with Elizabeth, and I'm not just saying that because we're on stage together. I feel really blessed from the moment, moment it happened. Oh, I know, you know, I don't feel like, is, it, is that okay? I just have to get closer. Um, uh, I don't know if you all know what happened with Elizabeth when she first started working at Grove Atlantic. Can I just go back there really quickly to just no, 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 no. give them a sense of... Uh, <laughs> so she got there, and one of the very... The first thing she did, really, was pull a book out of the slush pile and go to uh, the publisher, Morgan, and say, I want to do this one. And it was Cold Mountain. And uh, so it, it rocketed her to sort of um, editorial rock star fame really quickly. And she was very young. This was 20 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and so to answer your, I mean, she, and she's gone on, as you heard, to, to edit some really, really great, great writers and to, um, 
to stay at Grove and have and kind of create a real family there for her authors that is um, extremely unique in this day and age. It just it just I don't know anybody else who who has that experience if they're not published at Grove. To be honest with you, um, so I didn't know any of this, any of it, when I wrote a novel. Um, I think I started it in. 1991, and I was ready to send it out in 1997, I believe, and I didn't know what to do. I had gone to grad school. I really didn't have any friends who had published novels. I didn't know where to send it, and I was having this conversation with my mother, and uh, and she said, you know, why don't you send it to Elizabeth Schmidt? Her, she was friends with Elizabeth's mother, um, <laughs> and uh, and I was like Elizabeth Schmitz, you know, I had known, I had known, I'd met Elizabeth um, years earlier when we were like sixteen, when I was sixteen, she was fifteen or something like that, and I had heard she worked at Disney, and it was confusing to me why my mother thought that Elizabeth Schmitz would be the person. It was um, Warner for about one minute. Okay, Warner Disney, sorry, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And so I, I couldn't quite understand that, but she said, you know, she will know, she'll, she'll know, you know, about agents maybe and what agents to send it to. And so I did call Elizabeth up with so much trepida trepidation because I really didn't think she would remember who I was. Um, and I also, you know, it's uncomfortable. I had a novel, she was an editor. Uh, you know, I didn't want her to think that uh, I was, you know, wanting to send my book directly to her. I really was just looking for some advice about how to get an agent, and um, and I and actually, I don't know. I had this other weird connection. What you know, what you do when you are desperate and you don't know anything. My my, if I can get this right, my husband's um, uncle's second wife had an agent, and uh, and so I asked, called up and asked. Elizabeth, if she thought she was any good. Um, and so I had this whole list, and I just sort of wanted to know which ones, you know, I should pay attention to. So I, I ended up going um, with, actually, my husband's <laughs> uncle's second wife, because um, I liked her the best. She was wonderful. And after a long time of her ignoring me and not answering my calls, <laughs> um, she finally said, okay, I finally wrote her and I said, you know, I'm coming to New York. And she said, okay, when? This is actually the agent. And then the agent, I go to New York, I meet with the agent, and she takes out a pad of paper. So, you know, where do you want to send it? <laughs> and, uh, and so we made a long list and the agent said, you know, I think we should send it to Elizabeth at Grove. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, feeling I, like it might put Elizabeth in a funny position, but... It was not a funny position at all, and um, what ended up happening was I got into an auction to publish, you know, a, a, an old friend's book. <laughs> and, but and it was perfect, and it's just what I wanted for Lily. And she had some choices to make, um, a lot of choices, and um, and and uh, we that that's when we started having probably the first of a, a series of many many long conversations over the years. But the first one we had was over that book, and and I was trying to be very um, unbiased in telling her what about her options and, of course, hoping that she would choose to come with Grove, which she did in the end. Um, and then we embarked on our first book together, The Pleasing Hour, which um, was a tremendous success for a debut book. Um, it was, it uh, was a, won the Barnes & Noble Discover Prize, and we sold it in five countries, and it was an ed editor's choice. Um, and one of the great, I think one of the great things about um, our history together is that Lily's career has really followed a sort of old-fashioned trajectory in publishing. You know, you, we all hear a lot about those million-dollar first advances, you know, that are being paid. And um, and Lily's, she got a very get one. she got a very respectable, <laughs> nice advance for her first book, but it was not seven figures. But she's she's over the course of 2017 years, um, every every book has developed and has sold more and more copies and has won more and more acclaim and more attention and reviews and and you know with e with every one we thought well this is her breakout and it was but then the next one was even more of a breakout and you know the penultimate the fa father of the rain really was you know a, a big breakout for her it, it it and yet then here we've gone again and 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 now euphoria is but it it, it really is the sort of the old fashioned way of publishing where you you know you start with uh, with a first book and then you build um, over the course of a career and and it's extremely gratifying um, as an editor to work with with someone who's learning that way over the course of many many years. It's it's also exciting to have you know the first shot out of the gate 
be a success, and Cold Mountain certainly was that experience. But there's um, something really extraordinary about the way we've been able to mm. build a professional working relationship together, don't you think? Um, I wanted to just go back to that initial first conversation. We were, <laughs> we were um, reminiscing about that this morning, and we both remembered exactly where we were in our apartments. And uh, I, there were, for, I think there were five um, editors who were sort of in the running for a little while, and then four, and then, and then three, and then two, and then it was really down to two. And I, and I feel like at some point, with, I talked to Elizabeth and had the real talk about what she thought about the book, and um, and I had already had the conversations with the others, and and the one who was really r r as interested as Elizabeth, um, and kind of stayed in to the end. Um, basically, we had a great conversation about the book, and I liked her so so much. And she said. Uh, I said, well, you know, what would you want to change? What are you thinking? And, she, and and I have a memory of her saying, you know, I really wouldn't change anything. I think it's, I think it's great the way it is. And then I talked to Elizabeth, and she just dug right in, and she said, you know, I really think we need to identify to the reader that the um, we are not going off here in this section into other voices. That you know, we have to have an overarching. Um, the narrator needs to come in, and she's like, and I think we should move this here, and I think that, and I and and for some writers, I think. Uh, don't touch it, it's perfect is exactly what they want to hear. And I was not that writer at all. I had been in workshops forever since high school with my writing, and I was really used to that feedback and, and how can I make this better and, and having a conversation. And I, I got off the phone, and I was like, well, that's that's it. And uh, and I, I really feel like I absolutely made the right choice. And Elizabeth, when she edits, um, it's all it's it's all by hand with pencil. And so there's not this horrible, what is it even called? You know, when you get the, fi the, the, the one on the computer, there's some, I don't even know what it is because I don't have to do it. What is it? Track changes, yes. Oh, OK. I just get this great stack that you can tell it has coffee stains, you know, it, it practically has blood stains on it. Like it's just been on, you know. Sometimes little notes saying, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Pasta sauce, the whole thing. And then, and, it, and it's all. Uh, you know, kind of not, the edges aren't even or anything like that. <laughs> and it comes in this big thing with a rubber band around it, and it has comments on every single, in every single margin, every single page. And, and what is so great about being edited by Elizabeth is that uh, she's hard, she's tough, she doesn't let you get away with anything. And I, I like to pride myself on thinking that I... I really avoid cliches. I try to get every single one, but sure enough, cliche, cliche here. I mean, she thinks things are cliches that I would never think are cliches. <laughs> and then, but she also, uh, she has smiley faces, and she has check, 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 and then, oh, Oops. Jesus. <laughs> she, <laughs> <laughs> she writes, uh, toward the end of Euphoria, I remember, crying here, <laughs> crying now. <laughs> Crying again, and it's just like, you know, she takes me through all of her emotions of the book. And that is so thrilling as a writer, because you, you just don't get that. You know, when it goes out in the world, you, know, you, you get nice, really nice, but you don't, you don't get that penciled in sort of, this is how I'm feeling right here and here and here and here. And it, it really is magical. Well, that's really the beginning of the conversation, isn't it, you know, about it. We, we've, it's, it's funny, we usually start, we start with a really long, long talks on the telephone about just the overarching themes. And, and these can go on for hours um, and take place over several days. And then it sort of winnows down to her, uh, Lily waiting for my notes on a manuscript. Um, and that will come in you know, a big stack with the pencil handwriting all over. And, um, and, then, and then Lily will read through that very carefully. And I, I, I really think of that process as just being a very close reader, someone with the luxury of time to just read very, very closely and ask her a lot of questions. That, yes, this is how I, I was feeling. Is that what you intended? And, right, and, right. and, and then Lily decides what to accept or not to accept and then she types it into a, a whole new draft you know on the on the computer or wherever so that when I get it back again it's just a clean clean new clean manuscript there's no n notes responding to what I, what I suggested right. or anything so I, I get to read it again just clean um, and I think that's that's really important and then at that stage if I go through it again if I'm if I notice that she didn't change things I you know, I'll uh -huh. either maybe let it go or I'll n mark yep. it again. I try and to get away with things. <laughs> it doesn't, I don't um, very often. 
And then, you know, we just it gets winnowed down, maybe two, tw two or three times. It, it all depends. Every book is different. Um, and and um, by, But by the very end of the process, I would say we are sometimes talking or emailing each other, just discussing the language in a sentence or maybe even a word, you know. Um, it always comes down to, at the very end, there's always one or two things that we have been fighting over the entire time. <laughs> and she digs in and I dig in and neither of us were, will budge. And with, um, with Euphoria this time, it was Bankson's finger. <laughs> At the very, the very, literally, it's such the last, last draft, I suddenly revised the, um, there's a scene on the boat when Bankson is coming back. And I, I won't give too much away, but there is a, uh, it's hard to tell about it. It is when, hard to tell. Yeah, about I it. guess I might give it away too much. But anyway, I'll just say vaguely that I, because of certain things that happen in the book and what has been explained, um, I had him chop off a finger, and she couldn't stand it, and she fought it and fought it, and I thought it was so good. I thought it was exactly what he would have done, and. Uh, and then there was, there was this moment where I was at the car dealer. My car was broken. I was, uh, I was in the waiting room, and she called me up, and she said, I'm about to hit send to print this novel for the hardcover. <laughs> Will you take out that finger? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember sitting there and looking at all the other people in the car dealership and being like, okay, I'll take out the finger. And I did it, and she got her way, and she always gets her way at the very end. <laughs> but oh, I wanted to say too, when you talk about the process, my very, I want to really want to know your favorite part of the whole thing, but my favorite part of the whole thing is when I, um, we have this time, it's probably when I've gotten the manuscript and the rubber band around it and I've gone through, typed it up, send it back to her, and then she's going to send it back to me, but she wants to go through things. And it might be the th second time we do this or the third time we do this, but there's a time when we sit down and I remember with Father of the Ring, we devoted two full days, and we'd, I'd sit down at my kitchen table, and I have this little like headset thing that I plug into my phone, and, I, and uh, it's like a hands-free thing, and then um, and I have the manuscript, and we go through page by page. It took us two full days, and I'm in my kitchen, and she's in her office, and I just remember I kept <laughs> like making a bowl of cereal, making scrambled eggs, you know, because I was hands-free, I could do anything, and. Uh, and, and she kept on saying, are you eating again? Are you eating again? And there was one day where we talked from like 9 to 4, and she'd only had a granola bar or something. And <laughs> I had this whole kitchen at my disposal. But it's just such, you know, I write these books, and they take me a really long time, you know, four or five years. And, um, and it's very, I'm all alone in my room for all that time. And then I have a teammate. I have somebody on my side who's working with me, and it really, really is a great, great pleasure. That's definitely one of my favorite moments too, and that you know that's something interesting about the author editor relationship. It's I mean everyone is different. I mean even book by book it's different. Um, um, some some authors like to work on the telephone in that way. Others couldn't bear it. They want everything. <laughs> you know they just need to be alone in a room and they want everything in writing or they want everything emailed or fa I mean everybody is everybody is very different. But there does you know there does come a moment um, when it's it's time to sort of put away everybody else's ideas on what should be done in a book, you know? Um, and it's, it's uh, authors share, you know, they have reading groups or close friends or family members or all, and at the beginning stages, we're sort of listening to everything, right? And taking everybody's thoughts and ideas into consideration. But as the yeah. process gets yeah. whittled and whittled down and toward the end, there comes a time when you have to stop. And um, yeah. that it, there really is this, you know, it, it is a relationship, and, and you have to trust each other. And, um, you know, something even with Euphoria, we had a, 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 a very last-minute reader come in, you know, mm. at, at, a, at a really late stage, mm. and it's, it can be kind of rattling, you know. He liked the finger. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a, num and a number of other things that he wanted <laughs> that, you know, weren't there that, you know, Lily felt that she then had to go write and put in and, you know. And then take out. And then take out. And, um, but there, there is, um, you know, at the, at, the, at the end of the day, it's the author's book. And the author should absolutely do whatever feels most natural. And that's, I always tell you that. No, you I? do. It is, it is very true. 
It is very true. I have a question for you. Do you, is it hard after a book comes out and you watch it go out into the world and there's no mention of you, you know, it's the book and it's the oh, thank author. goodness for and, that. <laughs> and you might have had these great ideas and they get celebrated in a review or something and you get no credit for oh, it. Oh, but that's, that's the whole, that, that's the reward <laughs> right there is when the reviewer says it. It really is. And no, I, I live in fear of, of an editorial, of a, of a critic saying, where was the editor <laughs> in this book? <laughs> that's really terrible. And I, I'm, I don't think that's ever happened. Um, but it, but it easily could, you know. And there, there are some writers who don't actually don't want this process, you know. They, they, they're happy with um, mm -hmm. as it is, or they want less of it, or it takes time. It takes time to win the trust. Uh, uh, you know, we've been working together for 17 years. We practically speak in code to each other now. And 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 Lily, as she's writing, she she will she knows Elizabeth's not going to like this. <laughs> you know, she can take it out. It's a different. Yeah. It's true. I have your voice in my you head. You must have I'm to fight writing. to get rid of it sometimes. It, yeah, so, but you know, it, it's a good voice. I mean, it, it's a great voice to have. I, you know, it stops me from making a lot of mistakes, I think. It really does. We have a, what, how much time do we have? Like 10, 15 minutes? Um, so is it question time or? I, I wanna, I, I'm seeing if I have any other questions for you. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> it is? Hi. <laughs> so we have about 10 minutes for questions. So I would ask the, those of you that have questions for our author to come up to the, oh, right, to the microphone phone. there. Don't be shy. But if there's not, we can keep asking each other <laughs> questions. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Oh, yay. What is that line? When oh. does editing feel like co-authorship? Yeah, the, the editor moves into a role that you know, spurs over that line. Uh, I would say Elizabeth has never crossed that line. I, I have had editors uh, you know, uh, for shorter pieces and um, you know, who try to actually write sentences. And that doesn't really work for me because suddenly it isn't my, uh, Elizabeth would never, she, oh, if she has a suggestion, she would say something like, you know, but in your words, <laughs> you know, she would always, always, always say that. Never would she write a sentence no, or, would never. or so, even a phrase, really. But just to lead her in a direction, I think you need a phrase here, something like this, but don't use this, you know, and then maybe a couple of ways of doing that, and then she would rewrite it and put it in, if she agrees. I, I don't think I've ever come dangerously close to, to, to that, ever. I, I don't write. I don't write anything. Um, in fact, I think some of, some of what I do, and, and you've commented on this before, is some, some of it is, is, is I try to ad adopt her mm -hmm. language and her thoughts and try to think, how would Lily do this? And wouldn't she do it something like this? Mm -hmm. And I would never suggest a word or phrase that wouldn't be one that you would use. Or if I do, you say, yeah, that's yeah. not my word. Yeah. So... It is the beauty of a really good editor, somebody who takes the book on its own terms and doesn't try to, you know, change it into their own vision in some way. Yeah. So yes. question from an, a writer followed by a question from an editor. I'm absolutely thrilled <laughs> that mm -hmm. you have, that you have a co-director and editor here. Um, but a question specifically about your book. And I don't want to give away things I shouldn't. Right, right, so it's tricky. So I will tricky. try to use kind of coded language and hope it makes sense. And okay. If it doesn't, then just... Okay, thank right. you for being sensitive to that. Um, a book about very famous people, much of the book adheres very closely to... Can you all hear? To real life. Can you, can you get closer to the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay, a book about very three very famous people, much of it adheres very closely to their lives. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, quite different. Right. And I'm really curious why that was the, the decision because the real life version is quite dramatic. Yeah. Um, and how that played out into the editorial process. That's a great question. Really great question. I'd love to hear your um, thoughts on that. I mean, I can address how it happened for me is I really did think that I would stick to the biographical facts and that I was writing this book um, about these three people, and in fact, I called them init initially for the first half chapter, Margaret and Rayo and Bateson, and I thought that I would tell that story. 
Um, the problem was is that I have never written a biography before, and I have written novels. And so the novelist immediately kicked in because I had to invent dialogue and I had to invent scene. There's very there's there's really not a lot of facts about that five month period. Um, you have to dig hard and you don't find all that much. You certainly don't find scene and dialogue. Margaret Mead said that she met Gregory Bateson, they talked for 36 hours straight and she fell madly in love with him. But not once does anywhere does she give me one line of dialogue <laughs> of that 36 hours. So um, I, the minute I started inventing things between these three people, I, I thought I was on one train, you know, the biographical train, and then I thought I was on a parallel train um, with my fictional characters, I gave them fictional names, but we were going to go in the same direction. And literally, we went, Whoa. we followed along for a certain point, and then, and 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 I think it's because, you know, and all a lot of it plays out in the end, the the very the big difference. And I think a lot of it is that, um, as a novelist, you know, you're all you're 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 listening to your characters, and you're you're writing very instinctively, you're following them, it feels like you're following their lead. It doesn't feel like you are making the choices. I know that sounds strange and sort of supernatural, but that sort of is the way, and you kind of have to just follow that. And you want your end to be surprising, but also completely inevitable. And for whatever reason, that ending was very inevitable given the beginning and the middle of that story. Um, and I, I had, to follow my instincts as a novelist. And so that, that's sort of how it happened. And, and really, I didn't think about the rules. I, 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 you know, I just had to let myself go, and I would, we would puzzle it out later about if I was allowed to do that. You know, I, I don't read a lot of historical fiction. I really didn't have a lot of experience with it whatsoever, but I thought that I would talk to Elizabeth afterwards. So we have time for mm. about one more question. Do you want to yeah, can I just, just quickly respond? answer that? Um, so from Sorry. my point of view, um, Lily did an immense amount of research in, into these characters' lives. Um, and you know, one of the beauties of the book is that, as one critic said, she didn't lard her story with all the research details. I think that's one of the great beauties of the book. For me, as an editor, I almost, of course I wanted to run out and read a Margaret Mead biography, but I did not. And I actually didn't do any research at all so that I could approach the editing job and her reader as, as, as a reader of a novel mm -hmm. and make this story work on its own terms within these four walls and, and, and not think about the reality. So in fact, it was a blessing that I didn't know too much so I could really work with her on just her story. So. Good afternoon. On, on the question of historical research, um, as, a, as a fan, unexpectedly and happily reading this, a fan of the history of science, we have two young sciences which are dovetailing anthropology in the field and young Jungian mm. psychoanalysis. Right, right, right. Um, the editorial decision behind the grid mm. on page 189, <laughs> it's really the only graphic we have besides a map. I'm just wondering what the logic was behind this almost sexualized id of the grid build that's going on there. And, and well, that, and that question is it. Second question to follow up, but that's it. Uh, yeah. So um, I found that in, um, in the, a biography of Margaret Mead, and I did a little more research about it, and, and she called it the squares. They did, she and Bateson and Fortune did have this breakthrough that they thought was very, um, powerful and important, and they tech they texted. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> they telegraphed um, Boaz and said that her mentor, um, and they they said we're coming home. We have we've had a breakthrough, and and it was sort of a a personality um, scheme, you know, kind of a breakdown of various personalities, and they were applying tribes and cultures and that sort of thing. And and I really I did sort of steal that whole cloth from, from their work. But th they never published it. And, uh, but I thought it was, I, I loved the idea of three people in the middle of this love triangle having this intellectual breakthrough together and sort of needing each other and feeling threatened by each other and really confusing each other and emotions are running so high. And yet, um, they're able to do this work together 
um, and, and have that you know, euphoria, really. And, and, uh, and so I did have a graphic in there because it was, seemed like it was the only way to describe what they were putting on the paper. And it was great to come across it in the manuscript. And one of Lily's first questions was, can I include the grid? Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> and I said, absolutely, we can do that. And it's tricky. It's tricky to just insert that in the middle of a, a textual book. But it's really important and really fun to come across and explain so much, mm. I think, really. And the, the, the end papers were just really a, a beautiful folly. <laughs> yeah, that was really <laughs> we were fun. We are very happy to be able to put in those maps, yeah, in that color. Did you say you had a second question? No? Yeah, yeah. Do, you Do you sure? You can hurry time? up and ask yeah, it. Sure, <laughs> go ahead. Why, why not? Is there, is here, here's some controversy. Is there something as gracious and generous and loving as Nell is and these characters are, is there something inherently, as psychotherapy is, selfish about exploring oneself and one's love life by charting these foreign people, does that smell of colonialism? Absolutely. I mean, I honestly think that every act, every moment smacks of colonialism. I mean, from the, from the very obvious to having 200 porters bring their stuff up this mountain, um, to all of their notions of possession. I think that they, they are really, um, the re I think the real reason for all of their problems is this notion of trying to possess each other, another culture, knowledge, you know, it goes on and on. And, and uh, of course, I, I'm not really a writer who likes to hit the reader over the head with all of that or lecture or anything like that. And um, I've been very, uh, happily surprised by how many people get all of that and how how um, how it's all in there um, and 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 people are really reading it carefully and and seeing that so yeah I think that's that's all through it do you want to comment on that um, I, no except I completely agree um, from from the very first sentence in the book, you know, on the first page, you she's writing from this perspective and she's commenting on it all the way through um, the colonialism of, of the time and what they were doing. It's it's um, and that's in, in a way the the fascinating history of it. You know, not not just these three people, but our history um, of colonialism. And they are. Um they're condemning the missionaries, the miners, you know, um, and at the same time, they're very unaware of their own greed and, and certainly the way they are disrupting um, the law. I mean, it becomes clear to them at the end, probably. Um, and I, I'm sure afterwards there was a great deal of remorse, but certainly it's n n does no way justify um, that sort of, that sort of approach. And, and I, well, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. So um, just want to remind you that uh, our author, uh, Lily King, will be downstairs <laughs> autographing <laughs> her book Shoot. with, I'm sure, her editor. <laughs> uh, so please join me in um, giving them another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.